My name is Steve Dunwell. I'm a professional photographer. This is the uh, only career I've had for decades. I started in the 70s. And um, initially I was doing, I was working in documentary photography. I had trained a little bit in college with a, a famous documentary photographer, Walker Evans. And so I kind of started off in that mode, but then I shifted after about 10 years into uh, more commercial photography, and I've been running a commercial photo business based in Boston for all the time since then. Uh, this exhibit is designed to, to show mill workers in the textile industry as I found them in the early 1970s. The, the range of dates runs from 73 to 77. During part of that time, I was living in Providence, Rhode Island. After that, I moved to Boston, so there was part of it was Rhode Island focused, and other part was then moved a little bit north. But in both cases, I was totally fascinated with the world that I discovered inside these mills. And the best examples that we had then were textile mills, because that was the dominant manufacturing paradigm. We had other things, we had shoes, we had paper, but textiles was way more than those others. And so I tried to focus primarily on the textile industry in New England, the workers who were actually employed in those factories, and especially looking at places where the industry was concentrated, where it would be almost the only job in town. Of course, there are hundreds of places like that around New England, but when I started, I didn't know that. I thought, oh, maybe it's just a few places because I hadn't seen it, you know? I was really lucky that I, uh, I met somebody through a friend who owned a textile mill in Fall River. And he said, you know, you want to come look at this place. You might like it. And so I, you know, I said, okay, sure, I'll come out. So I went to his mill in Fall River. It was Providence Pile Fabric. It's one of the mills that is shown in the pictures behind me. And from the moment I went in the door, I was astonished and uh, amazed at the world that I saw there. Partly the environment, just the physicality of it, but also the people who were there, the machines, the uh, atmosphere, the noise, the dust, the everything banging around, moving around all the time. It was really like a world of its own, and I was captivated right at the beginning. Well, access is a key ingredient to every photographic endeavor, especially journalistic endeavors, where you have to go into someone else's premises, their business, their home. Access is a big deal. And I was very lucky to have limited access at the beginning. I mentioned that I, I met somebody and he said, come on over. Then I went from there to the uh, Slater Mill historic site in Pawtucket. And through Slater Mill, I met another range of mill owners who said, yeah, you could come to my place. And they would say, oh, you could come to my place. I also would sometimes cold call. I mean, I'd just, you know, I'd see a place that look, look, was interesting. I'd literally knock on the door and say, you know, here I am. I, I, may I take some pictures? Uh, early on, I got a grant from the Rhode Island State Council in the Arts. That gave me a little bit of uh, kind of credibility, like authenticity, so I could say, I have a grant. I'm doing this project. May I come to your factory? or may I go to this part of it, or something like that. And from time to time, people would say yes. There was a lot more openness in the 1970s, and of course, there would have been in decades before that, too. A lot more openness to letting people go into a factory environment than there would be now. This would be very, very difficult to get this kind of permission in numerous places. You might get one or two, but you wouldn't get like 20 of them. But in the time that I was working on this project, I, I went to um, a couple dozen factories inside and a much larger number outside. So I would kind of go to different places and look around and you, eventually you kind of get the idea of how to smell a mill like that's coming around the corner because a lot of topography is involved. I also concentrated on water powered mills. I mentioned Fall River earlier, of course that was not primarily water power, but most of the factories I went to started with water power and therefore they were in valleys with rivers and dams and you can kind of tell when you're in a place that has that configuration you look around a little bit and you say you know i'll bet the mill is over there and usually it would be because they put it where the best place would be so i went to quite a few places 
a combination of referrals, connections, cold calls, just kind of hanging around. People would say, yeah, come on in, you know, whatever. You want to take some pictures? Fine, go out back. Usually they would say, just don't get hurt because these places are all dangerous. And this was at the time when the OSHA safety regulations were just beginning to come in. Also, it was a time when uh, pollution controls had not really uh, been uh, promoted as well. So the typical mill site there had a lot of dangerous machinery. It had a lot of pollution. They would just pour their whatever residue, they just pour it out the back door, you know, or pour it in the river. There was that kind of thing. And the machines frequently did not have proper safety guards, so that if you were careless, you really you could get hurt, and people did. But they'd say, come on in, look around, take your pictures, just don't get hurt. That was kind of the way things went. Well, let me tell you about the, the technique that I use for this, because it's a, a key ingredient in the, the type of photographs that I created. When I started this project, I was like in my early 20s, and my level of photo experience was somewhat lowish, and um, I was at, at the very beginning primarily working in 35 millimeter black and white Tri-X. That was kind of what I did. And so for the first couple of months, I was using that technique, and I was pretty disappointed with the results. It just, things didn't have quite the clarity that I wanted, and I just wanted something more. So a friend of mine said, well, you know, if you want a better picture, why don't you get a Hasselblad? You might like that. And if you want that camera, I can tell you someone who will go and sell you one used. And so that person was Phil Levine in Boston. I came to Boston, went to his store, bought my first Hasselblad. It was a 500C, which is the small boxy one, and one lens, and started working with that for a little bit. And then shortly after, I said, well, you know, I really need a wide angle, so I got a second lens. I had the normal, an 80, and a wide angle, which is the 50 on the Hasselblad. The Hasselblad shoots a square negative six by six centimeters. So I loaded the camera up with Tri-X. I had like two or three backs, two lenses, one camera body, one tripod, and that was it. And I used that, that kit, that setup, for almost all the pictures that you see in this show and almost all of the work that I did in this larger body of work. You know, perhaps we'll come back to this, that these are not the only pictures I took. These are simply the pictures of workers that I took, because I did buildings and other things like that. But for the first two or three years, I was doing Hasselblad only, two lenses, all squares. So in this show, I'm showing only square pictures, and I'm printing them square. And I'm framing them square, too. So it's like, we're into squares. I hope you like it, because that's what, that's what I'm doing. Selecting the pictures is always a challenge. That's you know a part of the photographic art is to identify the good ones and push the lesser ones further down the pile. And we all do that. All photographers do that. Um, in this particular body of work, because of the, the challenges of making pictures in a factory where the light level is kind of low and there's a lot of vibration and uh, technical challenges like that, the light systems are not that great. Because of that, the number of pictures that I would take per day was not really so very large. Also, the camera only takes 12 pictures on a roll. So shoot 12 pictures, go someplace where it's not too dirty, you know, reload, come back, do it again. And, and I was working on a shoestring. I had a very, very tiny budget for this. And it was primarily self-financed, although I had a little bit of support. Consequently, I would a typical day I might shoot three or four rolls of film, and that would be like basically uh, less than 50 pictures, of which there might be a few keepers. And then you, because I worked on this for several years, taking that like every, like every month I would go out for maybe five or six days a month, depending, kind of hard to say exactly, but then spread out over a couple of years, you end up with quite a few pictures. and. I really wanted to go with the ones that had, first of all, that were, met my technical standard, because there are always some duds that don't, especially when you're working in a dimly lighted environment, because if people move, the exposures might be at about a, a tenth of a second or a fifteenth of a second. So if someone's moving too much, you're not going to get 
then I'm not going to get a good shot. Focus is an issue. So anything that I, want, I looked at the ones that met my technical standard. And then I also would stay with people who I kind of found interesting. I liked their story and I liked the way they looked and the way they presented themselves. I mean, if someone was always kind of running away, I wouldn't, wouldn't bother with them. But people who wanted to talk to me, I would stick with those people. And so I would have more frames of showing an interaction with those people. Because these pictures are primarily portraits taken in a factory setting. In almost every case, the person is looking at the camera, which gives you know, a more uh, eye contact, of course. And I would stop and I would ask them their names and write it down. How do you spell that? You know, what's the name of your job? Uh, I had a tape recorder with me. And I would uh, sometimes use the tape recorder to kind of pick up on comments that they made, which I then transcribed and used in, a, in another publication mode. Um, so, and by the way, running a tape recorder in a textile mill is like a dicey proposition because it's, it's incredibly noisy and the quality of the audio was very poor. Nonetheless, I would still be able to get enough to say, oh yeah, he said, you know, I love my job or I've been working here since I was uh, a bobbin boy. I came, I carried lunch for my dad. There were a lot of people said things like that. And these, the people in this exhibit are primarily people from my father's generation. I was in my mid 20s when I did this work, and most of these people were in their 50s and 60s. But they're people who had, these are people who had started working when they were teens or less, typically 12, 13, 14 you know, lunch pail, bobbin boy, sweeper, that kind of thing, and then they would work their way up. And so they were career people in this industry. They had never done anything else. And they, the ones who, with the, there were certain people who had really great stories to tell. And I kind of went with those people, and I would stick with them like glue until I got a picture that I liked, and then I'd kind of move on to do something else. So the, the selecting was partly the people, the story, the, the, tech, the technique, you know, all of that kind of came into it. And eventually, I'd say I had maybe a hundred, you know, pretty good pictures out of some thousands that I had taken. And then from that hundred, I put 24 in this show. I used another uh, section of them in a photography book that I created that was called The Run of the Mill, published by David Godin in 1978. And so the, uh, the worker pictures went into that, along with other pictures of exteriors of mills, people in their homes, a lot of things like that went into it. From the beginning, I really, I dreamed of taking these pictures and creating a photography book, because I love photography books. I loved them from the moment I, I first saw these kind of things in the, when I was a, a teenager. And so my dream was that I would make these pictures, and they would be good enough that someone would you know, applaud and say, yeah, we can put these in a book, and a publisher, and all that. Well, little did I know how, what a long path that is, and how unlikely it is to succeed. Nonetheless, I was extremely fortunate that I started doing this work, I got a, a pictures in a couple of magazines, then I took the work that I had, I might have had, let's say, 20 pictures, and I took them to David Godin, a well-known art and photography publisher based in Boston, and a person who was clearly had an eye for this kind of thing. So I said, well, maybe, maybe him. So I went to him, and from the, almost from the beginning, he was really interested in this work and supportive. Initially, he kind of said, well, do a little more and then come back. And, but relatively soon in this process, he started to be actively interested and committed and saying, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to do a book. We're going to do a book together. But his idea was that it would be a book that had photography and that was done now, but would also have a history of the entire textile industry from day one in America until, well, like recent. What happens that I was not qualified to write that history, but I couldn't find anyone else who would do it. So eventually I kind of learned more and learned more and I ended up researching and writing that history and creating everything in this book that was called The Run of the Mill, published by Godin Press, 1978, that was a 350-page book, the first part of which is history, illustrated uh, copious illustrations of mill villages and machines and inventions and, and mill owners and 
uh, you know, uh, industrial magnates, the Appletons, the Lowells, the Perkinses, the Cabots, all those people, portraits of them, pictures of uh, uh, mill construction, pictures of the Amiskeag in Manchester, uh, Bates in Lewiston, places like that. So all that old stuff, and then my work, my contemporary work, was the latter part of the book, the, like, the last 40%. So it was like 60% history, 40% uh, documentary photography. And that's that's kind of was the whole project, which was finally, as they say, published in 78. The entire thing took five years. But the worker part was the earlier part. But the pictures you see here, were they were done 73 to 77. And then for the last 77 to 78, that was all library and copy work and all the things you need to do to and, and writing of course so that was the that was the arc of it started early in 77 ended late in 70 early 73 late 78 every photograph has a story i particularly like photographs that tell a story i think they're more interesting and certainly every one of the images in this show has a story of its own because each one is an individual person and that person has their own story. Nonetheless, I'll mention maybe maybe uh, one guy in particular who really um, really amazed me. Although, uh, frankly, every person in here amazed me, each in a different way. Uh, but there's one of the guys here who was his name is Francis Grant. He was operating a machine that's called the spinning mule. So his job was called mule spinner. It's a little confusing because there are folk songs about mule skinners and mule spinners, and it's hard to know which one is which. But anyway, the mule spinner was a very unusual skill and quite different from the other spinning techniques. The machine would kind of go forward, and then you would walk backwards, and it would spin as you walk backwards. And it was a very arcane kind of thing. I had never met anybody who did this work until I went up to a really tiny little mill in Maine, Harmony, Maine. The place was called Bartlett Yarns. They were spinning uh, woolen thread. They called it worsted. Uh, worsted means a woolen thread. And so they, they were specializing in this. And they had what might be the, the last spinning mule like in, in America just about. And this guy was in charge of it. And he had been doing this for decades. He was so skilled at it, you know, and he just took it like, you know, it's just my job, I just do this. But he was actually doing something that no one else did. All the others were gone. You know, there might have been hundreds of people who did this a hundred years ago, but he was really the last of his type. And I could, there were numerous other examples of that in, in this collection of pictures of people where they were pretty much the last person doing that job. Or after them, the, the job disappeared, the mill disappeared. Uh, for example, um, one of the uh, images behind me shows a, a woman who is, uh, it's called mending. She is actually inspecting a woven fabric. Her name is uh, Beatrice Rochefort. And she was in a mill in Pasco, Rhode Island, Forestdale. Horsdale, Pasco. She was in Pasco, okay? And uh, her job was to take the cloth, after they had woven it, it was, again, worsted, it was a pattern, like plaid, and she'd go over it, like, line by line, thread by thread, and if she found a thread that was not in the right place, she would fix it by hand. So they call them, you know, skips and mispicks and drops. There were a lot of different names for that. But her job was to look, look over the fabric and do this. Well, it happens that she worked in, she needed, you have to have really bright light to do that. She was, so they tended to put that, the people who did that job, in a brightly lighted room. It was also very quiet because there, there's no machine, right? It's just, you just kind of pull on the thing, send me some more, look at it, stop, take out your thimble, and fix these things by hand. And uh, she and her coworkers really were like, uh, kind of like the, the princesses of this mill because they got to work in a place, first off, they were, it was only women. It wasn't noisy. It wasn't dirty. The light was better, you know, and, and so they really felt like it was kind of okay, you know, and they eventually had to, you know, they, they kind of decorated the area around them and they would 
write little messages on the wall. So it was very personalized as a, as a place to work. It was pretty cool. That factory burned down a couple of years after I finished, all gone. And that would be true of an, several of these, especially one in Forestdale. I have another couple of pictures of the card room in Forestdale. Like a year and a half after I took those pictures, the mill burned, all gone, and that site is still empty 40 years later because it was so polluted with their waste and their you know, residues and all that. They just kind of threw it on the floor. So polluted, it's been a Superfund site for 40 years, never cleaned it up. Still sitting there with a, with a cyclone fence around it. In any case, every picture has a story like that. And in many cases, I would transcribe their stories and uh, make a, like a two paragraph um, summary of it. And I would put that with the photograph in the book, The Run of the Mill. So that's kind of how I, I did it. Lots of great stories.